Good afternoon. My name is Becky Robinson, and I'm calling in today from snowy Michigan. And I have with me Dr. Kathy Kramer, who's called in from St. Louis, Missouri. And Kathy told me that yesterday it was 80 degrees, and today it's 35 degrees. So as we begin the broadcast, I want to invite all of you to try out the question panel. It's on the GoToWebinar panel. And why don't you tell me where you're calling in from and what the weather is like as a way to test out that technology. Throughout the call, we're going to break for your questions, and you'll have the opportunity to type those in, and we'll share those with Kathy, and um, she'll be able to interact with you and share her thoughts. So I would love to know where you're calling in from. Let's see, we have someone in Chicago, Orlando, 83 degrees, Philadelphia, San Diego, a windy day in Dallas, Portland, Oregon. We have a caller from Switzerland, someone calling in from Alaska, where it seems like it's not much colder than St. Louis. It's 30 degrees in Alaska today. And we have uh, someone calling in from Northwest Arkansas, where there was beautiful weather yesterday and cooler weather today. Uh, we have a caller today from Sydney, Australia. So this will be truly a global call as we focus on the topic today of lead positive. My name is Becky Robinson. I'm the CEO of Weaving Influence. We're an online influence building company, and I'm thrilled today to host Dr. Kathy Kramer. Kathy is passionate about possibilities and potential. She's an Emmy winner, a business consultant, a psychologist, and an author. She has written nine books, including the best-selling book, Change the Way You See Everything. She created and has dedicated her life to asset-based thinking, also known as ABT. It's a way of looking at the world that helps leaders, influencers, and their teams make small shifts in thinking to produce extraordinary impact. Her latest book, Lead Positive, what highly effective leaders see, say, and do is launching next week, and we are so thrilled to be able to share Kathy and her content with you today. Kathy, before we begin, um, I just mentioned that you're going to be celebrating your book launch next week, and I wondered if you could help the audience get to know you a bit by sharing with us your favorite way to celebrate. Well, hi, Becky, and uh, I'd like to to say hi to everybody who's joining us live and uh, I would say my favorite way to celebrate has to do with cooking a, a meal in my little brief uh, intro that you read um, I really never cook the same meal twice but I always want to have something gourmet and then a way to celebrate for me is to be with close friends and to really feel the warmth and uh, the warmth of the relationships, which means so much to me in my life, family and friends. So that's my way of celebrating. Fantastic. So as we begin, Kathy, one more note of housekeeping. We are going to take questions and comments in the question panel. There's also a chat window if you have any questions. I'll also be monitoring that. And we'd like to invite all of you to participate and engage both by asking questions, but also if you use Twitter, um, we're going to use the hashtag lead positive, which you'll see on the bottom of some of the slides. And also Kathy's Twitter handle is Dr. Kathy Kramer. So we invite you to be interactive with the content and with us today. Kathy, are you ready to begin? I am ready. Absolutely. And I'm assuming everybody can see my first slide which really helps us all focus in on several things. Lead Positive is the title of the new book and was actually created by one of my editors uh, at Josie Bass. And I remember the first time I saw the title and heard her say the title to me, I said, Susan, that isn't grammatical. And she said, it doesn't matter. We want it to grab people's attention. And we're going to be talking a lot about grabbing your own um, attention and focusing it on the positive side of the spectrum. So I thank Susan for that and want everybody to notice that the subtitle actually includes the framework that we're going to be using. It's an asset-based thinking framework that highly effective leaders do. And of course, as you can easily see, it's all about what highly effective leaders see, say, and do. And the importance of that is see, say, do framework is really that it's a chain reaction. And as we'll see today, it's a self-reinforcing loop. Um, 
the last thing I want to say about uh, our time together is that you'll see this is an internal development process. You're really taking charge of your growth and your development as um, a leader. And so I want everybody to be actually uh, engaged in the activities, the CSA do um, activities, so that you can have an impact, you can practice and have an impact on something that's very important to you in your leadership today. So think about right now, think about some of the most important results that you're trying to um, achieve and pick one of them and let's use that as your kind of focus for, for the day and learning um, some of the secrets of highly effective leaders. The, uh, the next slide, how small shifts make seismic differences, really refers to the fact that uh, asset-based thinking, which is a very important focus, shining the spotlight of your attention on what's working, on what's possible, on what's strong and viable, um, requires a shift. And it requires a shift because by nature and nurture, we actually are more deficit-based thinkers. We are prone, because of our negativity bias, uh, to really be more sensitive to and reactive to the negative side of the spectrum. What's the problem? What's missing? What was my mistake? What am I worried about? How are other people letting me down? And that negativity bias that is hardwired, it, you know, had a lot of evolutionary value. It was a real emphasis on protecting us from harm and danger. And we can, we now know, we can shift out of that negativity bias into a, if you want to call it positivity bias, focusing on assets again in yourself, in other people. And in every situation, whether it's welcomed or unwelcomed, there are hidden inside of those situations uh, assets that really can help us move forward, make progress. And as we focus on assets, we can actually draw other people into our cause. We can help inspire and motivate. So for a leader, learning how to... Uh, take a limited supply of attention, and I want everybody to realize this, most of the time we don't know that our um, attention is limited, and so how it is directed, either by nature and nurture or by ourselves, is, is really important. Uh, we, we have a limited supply, and we want to make sure that we take advantage of what neuroscientists now call self-directed neuroplasticity. And what this is all about, it's a mouthful, self-directed neuroplasticity. What this means is you can actually train your brain. So if you practice with intention and effort, shining the spotlight of your limited attention on something that is valuable, something that is strong, something that is working in yourself, in other people, in the situation, you literally can, can develop and grow new neural pathways and networks that make the ability to pay attention to the positive much more automatic and much more frequent. So that's really what we're uh, all about. I want to show you one more slide before I get some questions and comments from you in the audience. And this is a um, this is a brain, or a rendition of a brain, of course. And I liked it because it was very uh, artfully done. And um, I do believe that the right and the left hemispheres need to work together in terms of the imagination and the logic of the situation uh, being um, available to all of us. And the, all, the other piece is I want to actually have you make a note here that the brain stem, the orange section and the purple section and part of the 
yellow section of this brain, um, this is where the motivation to protect yourself and others from harm really resides. In addition to some of the other standard functions uh, that you can see on the slide, I want you to notice that motivationally, when that part of our brain starts becoming very active, we are seeing something that we perceive as dangerous. One thing I always tell myself, and I'd like to remind you, is that we really don't see with our eyes. We see with our brains. And the brain makes, within milliseconds, an interpretation about what's happening to us and puts, us in, put it, puts it in the category of good, bad, asset deficit, harmful, helpful. And it's that part of the brain that actually uh, is the rudimentary, the earliest part of the brain that we, we developed uh, as a species. And um, the other areas that you see there, the blue area in particular, the kind of turquoise seafoam blue, is really the reward center of the brain, a little bit of the Lyme center also, the Lyme limbic system there under the temporal lobe will really help us seek rewards. So the motivation of that part of our brain when it is turned on um, helps us to move forward towards that which is intriguing, interesting, satisfying, goal-oriented, and it's, it's a very powerful sort of motivation. And the final area, the frontal lobe, that pink substance there is responsible for planning and thinking and problem solving, but it also has another motivational function, and that is to literally attach to others. This is the part of the brain that is motivated, uh, motivates us really to want to attach, bond, and in the case of human beings, collaborate, uh, consult and show compassion and caring. So the motivational systems are really important to remember and notice there are two very asset-based motivational systems, the attached to others and seek rewards. They're more highly developed later in us so they are malleable and literally are where the new neural networks reside that we can uh, that we can grow um, and develop when we become an asset-based thinking leader. So um, there are three activities now that I want to share with you before we go forward into the um, Q&A period and uh, they are based on a self-directed neuroplasticity technique that we call scan, snap, and savor. Scan, snap, and savor. So let me kind of unpack this for a minute. So scanning means that you're looking for something that is positive, interesting, uh, important, strong, heartening, and then you are going to savor what you see. Savoring meaning spending up to 15 to 20 seconds really letting your brain and your mind marinate in what you're looking at, that positive fact in a situation, the positive fact in yourself or someone else. And then the whole idea of Sorry, I meant snap. The snap is taking a snapshot. If you're not actually looking at it, we want you to have a mind's eye picture. That's the right hemisphere. And then the last step is savor. And that is where you let your mind marinate in the joy, in the satisfaction, in the reward of what it is that you are looking at. And I want to apply scan, snap, savor to three time frames. So this is kind of your ABT workout. It's a way for you to really form the foundation of training your brain to be more asset-based than deficit-based. And so let's focus 
focus on the past, three time frames. First, the past. And I'd like for you to use Scan Snap Saver to remember something in the past, maybe a week ago or 10 days ago, that you are grateful for. What has happened to you? What is in your life that you are grateful for? And I'd like for you to scan for that. Hopefully there are many things you're grateful for. And then take a snapshot in your mind's eye of whatever it is that comes to mind. I am so grateful. Actually, Becky, this um, applies to you. For example, I'm very grateful for Weaving Influence and Becky and her team helping me reach out on the social media platforms that are so new to me. And I'm truly grateful for that training and that, and that support. So I'm going to get a snapshot of you, Becky, in my mind. And then I'm going to savor what it feels like to have you and Don and Rachel and Carrie and Danielle really support me in this learning, this new way of connecting with people. Now the interesting thing is Scan Snap Saver takes less than 30 seconds and as I did that I actually changed my brain. I actually uh, developed new neural networks as Donald Hebb, um, a very important thought leader um, in neuroscience, came up with this little phrase that I like a lot, neurons that fire together, wire together. So I was literally changing my brain, and as I was doing it, I hope you were doing it. Those of you who um, are listening can really use Scan Snap Saver to focus, have a positive focus on the past. Um, and this is very important because, as Sonia Lubomirsky has taught us, we literally are prone to what she has coined hedonic ad adaptation. Hedonic comes from the word, the root, same root as hedonistic, so something that's pleasurable, adaptation. When things are good and pleasurable, if we're not careful, we will just take them for granted. That's really the technical meaning of hedonic um, adaptation. This is true of people in our family who we love. It's true for people who are in California. Uh, traveling down Highway 1 on the way to the grocery store, they, we, we as human beings lose sight of and really start to take for granted many things that are important and dear to us. So this scan snap saver on something I am grateful for in the past can fight that tendency. The next activity is a focus on the present. What is working in this moment? And I would like to suggest that everyone on the call and those of you who listen later, uh, try this ABT technique related to Scan Snap Saver on their commute home. I'd like for you to think present moment, this day, this moment, what can I say is working? How have I made progress today? How have we made progress today? It's really an inventory of what's going right, if you will. And as you scan for that, you're going to take a snapshot of several things that are going very well and tell you that you are on the right track. And as you do that, as you take a snapshot and then move to savor, you are literally releasing neurotransmitters that are in the category of endorphin. That's what we feel the old runner's high. Oxytocin, which is a great uh, painkiller, all is well. And dopamine, which I call the curiosity drug, where you're really releasing the kinds of neurotransmitters that motivate you to attach to others. And as we talked about earlier, seeking rewards, those very ABT centers of our brain. If we focus instead on what's not working in the present moment, what's frustrating us, what's anxiety provoking, what's reminding us that we have a whole lot that we haven't done yet, 
we get a different kind of neurotransmitter release. We get cortisol and we get acetylcholine. Both of those are stress hormones. So I call this technique kind of the scan, snap, saver, uh, prefrontal cortex cocktail. What cocktail do you want to have on your way home? Do you want to have the runner's high, the all is well feeling, and the, the thrill of dopamine, or do you want to saturate yourself with the stress hormones? It's really up to you. And now that we know we do have a choice, I'm hoping that you'll practice scan, snap, saver in the present really to assess progress and to strengthen your asset-based thinking network. The final time frame that uh, we can use in our ABT workout is, of course, the future. And as, as um, a leader, relative to what you're trying to make happen, the kind of results you want to create, uh, you may sometimes feel anxious and frustrated and disappointed and at other times feel very excited, high, thrilled. And this is natural. The Center for Creative Leadership did a study about, oh, I think about 12 years ago, where they interviewed over 5,000 leaders, CEOs, and asked them how did they feel as they were moving forward on their journey to lead and to, to master challenges. And they came up with both sides of the spectrum. Sometimes I'm excited, sometimes I'm really uh, frustrated and feeling a little despairing. Sometimes I am excited and know that people are with me and sometimes I feel all alone. So we've developed a very quick test called the See, Think, Feel test that I'm going to ask you to apply as you think about the future that you are trying to create, your leadership contribution to the world. Um, right this minute, as you think about those results and you notice your feelings, are they anxiety provoking or are they exhilarating? And the See, Think, Feel test can help you. Most people can tune into their feelings and then notice, what am I looking at? When I have my picture of the future, is, it, is that picture itself causing the kind of feeling that I want? See, think, feel. I see something, I have a thought about it, and I have a feeling. And those feelings oftentimes are our first indicators of what we're looking at and how we're thinking about the future. Um, when I talk to you in just a minute about Rudy Giuliani, I'm going to give you a way to shift out of negative feelings so that you can see, think, and feel in a positive way that can help you move forward. So Becky, I'm thinking this might be a good time, I've been doing all the talking, to hear from some folks in the audience in terms of the kinds of comments, questions that might be on your mind as we finish the first module of this webinar. Sure. Thanks so much, Kathy. I know that I've enjoyed participating along with you with those exercises, um, and I particularly enjoyed the past, thinking about something that from the past. So um, I appreciate that so much. And there's a lot of tweets going on Twitter. So thank you for those um, to everyone who's joining with us um, to interact online. There's a couple things here um, that have come in and I want to welcome also people to go ahead and type other questions or comments or observations as I'm sharing a couple. Uh, one is that um, the audience would like us to um, repeat what ABT stands for and share a bit more about that. Absolutely. Um, so ABT, let, it, let me take us back to the initial screen. You notice it says lead positive, what highly effective leaders see, say, and do. And it's based on the proven asset-based thinking process. ABT, of course, is the acronym. I'd like for you to think of asset-based thinking as a channel in your mind. 
like ABC, NBC, CNN, right? And that channel is dedicated to noticing and processing what is going well, what is valuable, what is possible, what is strong in yourself, in other people that you're relating to, and in every situation you find yourself in. So it's literally what we have been talking about is we want to create a bias towards asset-based thinking, or you could call it becoming an asset-based thinker, because that is in contrast to our innate, built-in negativity bias, which, give, which is another channel uh, in our mind. It's the channel that I've dubbed deficit-based thinking, or DBT for short. And as we zero in on what's not working, what's problematic, uh, what's disappointing, what is uh, frustrating, that in and of itself is leads to the chain reaction that we talk about in the subtitle. If I'm focused on what's not working, I'm going to talk about about that and I'm going to be problem focused I'm going to be in my fix it mindset and really what we want to do of course fixing problems is great but in this day and age we have so many problems thanks to our constantly changing volatile uncertain life everything from the weather that you brought up Becky to uh, what's happening in the Ukraine at the very moment we, we, uh, we get served by the media and we get served by ourselves kind of a more preoccupation with fixing problems, which is not as effective for, for leaders as being able to see, see the assets alongside of the deficits and really leverage those assets I call it the five to one principle, spend five times more interest and effort leveraging assets than you do fixing problems or getting rid of deficits. That's a really great approach. So Kathy, I have a few more questions. Uh, two people have actually uh, raised the question, how is the lead positive approach aligned with appreciative inquiry? Oh, that's a great question and that tells me that we have a lot of very well read people on the line. I always say, first of all, they're in the same family. And it's in the positive psychology family uh, where we're really looking at what's effective as opposed to what is defective. Uh, appreciative inquiry is to an organization what asset based thinking is to a person. So I said earlier in the opening that lead positive is an internal development process. And you can think in terms of the AI language, finding your own positive core in the same way that appreciative uh, inquiry seeks to find the positive core of the organization. That's the quickest and most complete way I think I can say it. That makes sense. And if there's any follow-up, I'd uh, welcome those uh, follow-up questions in the question panel. So we have a comment here from Les who says, often when I'm caught in a negative situation and I try to engage in ABT thinking to move forward positively, I find myself getting pulled back into the mental morass of negative thought and it's hard to stay on track with a positive ABT mindset. How do you control that drift, Kathy? I think I might even know who Les is. Uh, but if, if not, I would say that no matter who's asking that question, um, this is a very important question to ask yourself because you're noticing that whatever you're doing is actually not helping to shift, right? And so the technique that I want to give us in just a minute, I'm going to give now also. And I'm going to say that it's important to start with the small stuff. If you really want to learn how to shift out of deficit-based thinking to asset-based thinking, practice when you're in a traffic jam. I don't know about uh, all of you, but I'm usually, 
when I'm in my car, I'm on the way to some important um, appointment and I want to be there on time. And if there's tra um, a traffic jam, um, I begin sort of clenching my teeth and start uh, re reorganizing the way the the highway exits and entrance ramps are actually structured. I'm I'm there trying to, you know, sort of mentally argue with reality. And so the the technique that I want you to practice is called the ASA shift. It's an acronym. ASA A acknowledge. Acknowledge that you're frustrated, right? I'm in the traffic jam. And then S scan for something that is useful and valuable that is going on simultaneously. So this just happened to me uh, a day ago on my way to the airport. And when I was scanning for something positive, I noticed that it, while my car was stopped, I had found time, time I hadn't uh, imagined I would have, wherein I could make a phone call. I could think about the keynote I was going to do tomorrow. So I want everybody to understand, although you might be frustrated and there might be some real barrier, in this case tangible, like a traffic jam, uh, we, we have the ability to look for what else is happening simultaneously. It doesn't have anything to do with the traffic jam, but that literally is useful and beneficial. And as I found that found time, I was then able to complete the activity. The last A stands for ACT. I made the phone call. I reviewed my notes. So ASA shift is acknowledge that you're not feeling uh, on top of the situation. It's on top of you in some way. Scan for what else is going on and act on what else is going on. It doesn't make life perfect but it helps you be proactive. Wow, fantastic. I don't know about all of you, but I'm taking notes so that I can implement these later. So Kathy, I have more questions. I know you have more content. Uh, Celeste is wondering how the ABT approach um, can relate to our activities in the workplace, especially related to managing up. Managing up? Managing okay. up. All right, well, that's great. So. Um, we need to remember that people, including people who, re, who we report to, are attracted to people who come in with, who are solution focused and who also are possibility focused. And so if you do have an issue, a barrier, a problem, a challenge that you need to bring up, I always suggest that you think that you ask yourself the following question what would this problem look like if it were solved and all of a sudden you are in the future right the future moment where you can really see how what was initially a problem has turned into a set of benefits and if you're going in to somebody who reports to you, you can talk about the solution set. So never only talk about the problem, always bring in the solution set. And that is a very asset-based way of talking about what might be very tough issues. Um, I'm reminded right now as I'm thinking about this that how you talk about other people, people on your team, people who report to you, your peers, always needs to favor what it is that that those uh, individuals have to offer. What kind of contribution are they making? How are you helping them to develop and grow or to reach their goals? That's another thing that uh, that managing up, you know, we, we oftentimes leave other people out of the picture unless, of course, there's some kind of an issue or a problem. So I think managing up, you would always be talking about um, how people are real contributors and what their strengths are. 
Um, and I'm also thinking, and we're going to get to this in just a minute, what are the moonshots that you're going for? What are the possibilities, the real important breakthrough results that, that might improve uh, a system, might improve the market share, might improve customer satisfaction? You always need to be working on something that is not only motivational and inspiring to you, but also at the same time really beneficial to the organization, even if it's not on your performance goal list. So those are a few things you can do. Sure. And Kathy, um, there are just tons of amazing comments um, pouring in from our listeners that I'll share with you later. Um, but just it seems like uh, there are several people who are commenting on what an interesting perspective this is, how helpful it is, um, how they want to be able to implement this in their work. Um, and here's an interesting comment from Julie O'Leary. She said that the concept of solution and possibility-focused people not only change their own brain connections, it also changes the external energy that is given to others, and people can feel the difference. She notes that she's um, worked through equine coaching and sees how even horses can react to that energy that you're putting out into the world. So I thought that uh, the audience might enjoy hearing that comment. You know, that is, thank you so much for for mentioning that to all of us who can't see or hear that comment. So uh, energy fields are a whole nother way of uh, assessing and evaluating what are you putting forth. And of course, ho horses, animals of all kinds, I know my two puppies, actually have an emotional reaction to my mood. And so I really want to uh, emphasize a phrase that, that I haven't yet said, and that is that people follow people, not just great ideas. And so that energy that you're putting out either repels, if it's negative energy, or attracts. And you can think of asset-based thinking as the desire-driven channel and deficit-based thinking as the fear-driven channel. And most people are not attracted by somebody who's anxious and worried about what might happen, what could happen, what is happening. Leaders go first and people want to have their leaders be, be in the desire driven mode. How can we solve this? What would the problem, how can we, how can we milk the problem for all it's worth? How can we set, uh, a stake in the ground so that what we have here is a real breakthrough. So thank you for that comment. Sure. Um, I think that um, we're ready to move on to the next slide. Okay, great. And I, I did um, in advance by mistake, so I apologize to Rudy Giuliani and all of you who got a glimpse of him, but I have to say that he is one of my favorite role models for how to respond in a crisis or you might consider it real adversity. And um, I study people, leaders um, in, in all walks of life and I do write about Giuliani and many of those highly visible leaders in the book, Lead Positive. And I studied Giuliani not as a mayor but as a leader in response to 9-11. And I was so very struck from the very first moments of watching him on t television in his interviews. And I kind of summarized this as when you're leading positive in response to a crisis, um, you have to find something that is actually working in the middle of, in this case, a very horrific set of terrorist acts. What he found in the midst was the courage of the first responders. He was so struck by acts of heroism that he emphasized those in a much greater degree, five to one, five times more interest and effort in telling the stories, seeing, and then saying all of the stories that related to the first responders and their courage, to the generosity 
of people in New York to the world in terms of its support and compassion for what had happened uh, in New York, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we, we had an enormous amount of patriotic um, acts that were happening in response. And so in my lifetime, that has been the most uh, terrible kind of situation that I've ever indirectly experienced and the people on the ground for 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 Giuliani he, he was in his first first news conference at the police academy with Governor Pataki and one of the journalists said how many people have died now I want I want you to listen to what he said and I want you to notice that he did an Asa shift he acknowledged that the death and destruction was unspeakable. So he was acknowledging that first. And then he said, however, there must be survivors. He scanned for what needed to be tended to. What what literally, in this case, you know, what what lives could be saved? And he ended up with acting on that very important premise, there must be survivors, he said, we must act now. We must go and find them. So here he is in the, the very first moments of dealing with this crisis, doing an Asa shift. The, the devastation and the death is unspeakable. We cannot speculate. Yet there must be survivors and we must act now. And I was thinking that this might be a good place for us to tune in to the audience also, because I think whatever you're thinking and whatever comment you might want to make uh, about your own resilience or others' resilience, you know, the, the real outcome here is that, that, that Giuliani was able to spur the resilient actions and to communicate those to the world in a very inspirational way right in the middle of this crisis. So this is the ASA shift in action. And if you lead, you will in fact face sometime the kind of adversity that that is hard to believe you can cope with. But this is the way to do it. We need to use Giuliani as our role model. He is a very powerful role model. Um, and we do have some questions coming in from the audience, Kathy, so thank you for the opportunity to share them. Um, I have a comment or a question from Lisa. Uh, she asks, how do you help others grow in this type of thinking without sounding like a dictator? She tries to lead with ABT ideals, but how can she help others? Well, I have to say that most of us who are leading other people are very frustrated by um, naysayers and cynics. And it sounds like she might have encountered some of those kind of folks. I, I do really believe that cynics are disappointed optimists, that originally they had uh, a sense of what was possible and the optimism, the hope to move forward towards it, and they get disappointed. And the more you get disappointed, the more cynical you become. So I do think we can believe in the positive core of, uh, of folks wanting to have hope. So that's, that's my first thought, is that you need to look at those people as if they really have the capacity, the interest, and eventually the ability to move into a more, a more positive framework. Um, the next thing I find uh, very, I'll say, helpful and reassuring, we know from the change management literature that all you need is the square root of the population in order to be early adopters and uh, be enrolled and start following, in your case, the lead towards looking for assets, being more five to one 
focusing on yourself and other people and the situation in terms of what it has to offer. So when you think about it, if my math is right here, if you're dealing with 100 people, you only need 10 to create that positive nucleus that will eventually have a ripple effect. And so you can think of groups as having a built-in sort of negativity bias, right? And But they're always, in any kind of effort to move forward, they're always people. And again, all you need is the square root of the population. And if you're dealing with nine people, just think. You know, it's it's a third of that group. And um, so take heart and believe in the ripple effect. It is contagious. Both asset-based thinking and deficit-based thinking are contagious. So uh, I want you to find those people who catch your positive energy first and work with them. That's a great suggestion, Kathy. So here's another uh, question that we had come in. Um, this person is relating that um, sometimes finds himself in a state being captured between the two hormones and hard to get out of the situation. So what is your experience with the steps to be taken to diminish the hormones and think in a positive and energetic way? So maybe as you talked about the different cocktail that you can take on your way home from work, if you find yourself with a negative cocktail, how do you um, switch and get back to the positive side? So I do study the the techniques that help all of us do just that. One of my favorite ones is um, is really taught to us. The lesson is taught to us by uh, an American um, Indian tribe that had a saying that goes something like this: "The only difference between fear and excitement is breathing." And in the book, I talk about taking ten. If you can breathe you notice that you're caught one way or the other, take 10 seconds and just focus on your breathing. And this will give you the kind of control where you can grab the spotlight of your attention, right? It's limited, it's contained. Grab the spotlight of your attention and focus it on whatever the upside might be, no matter how small and Breathing gives you the time to contain yourself and really get back in control of what it is you're looking at. So the only difference between fear, deficit-based thinking, and excitement, asset-based thinking, is breathing. Fantastic. So everyone can take a deep breath right now. Um, Let's see, we have a comment that came in from Garrett. He said, in every cynic is a disappointed idealist. That's a quote from George Carlin, who was talking from experience. And you're referencing uh, a quote like that. Um, let's see, so here's a, a, another a question that came from Garrett. Would Carol Dweck's work about mindsets, fixed versus growth, give insight into how to help people see more possibility and positivity? Uh, for example, when recognizing people, recognize them for their effort rather than their talents, efforts being a growth concept and talents being a fixed concept. Could you speak to that for a few minutes, Kathy? Absolutely, and I couldn't agree more. I love her work, and I do think a focus on effort is really what helps people see. Uh, in psychology, we would call it their own se sense of agency, self-efficacy. Oh, I see. I'm able to put forth effort and I am really achieving things that are so important, I can be recognized for it. And so what I would add is a little structure that we have, that we use when we help people plan to give feedback. And it goes something like this. I saw you, and then you fill in the blank. I saw you, I saw your behavior. I saw your effort. I saw that you stayed late after work five times in a row. The next part is the impact on me. So if I'm your peer, if I'm your direct report, if I'm your boss, the impact on me was uh, you gave me the idea of putting forth, forth more effort myself, might be what I say. And then the third part is the impact on the group or the customer or the wider network of people who are associated with that 
that person who you're giving your positive uh, Carol Dweek effort based feedback to. And so I like to, to make sure that you praise the effort and also talk about the impact on you, the speaker who's giving the feedback, and on the wider group. Great. Here's another question. How do we overcome so much negativity when we are trying to stay positive? This comes from Maria Garcia. She says, I'm a very positive person, but find myself surrounded with so many negative people uh, that she has to deal with on a daily basis. So how do you block that out? Well, again, here we, here we have the, um, you know, if you can find one or two people who are kindred spirits, that obviously helps quite a bit. Um, you know, there are some extreme situations where you find yourself almost kind of a prisoner in a very negative culture. And I like to think of that as a chance for you to commit some acts of leadership. Uh, I wonder whether or not you could do, uh, make, make a process change, um, make a suggestion, a set of recommendations to improve the culture to to people who would be likely to listen. It might, you might not see it as your role um, and responsibility, but if there is a way for you to step out and step up and really maybe even just start the conversation, I think you will be surprised at others who, who feel the same way and who would like to help in the solution set for shifting an entire culture from DBT to ABT. We have a couple of stories uh, in the book about this uh, where people are not feeling um, engaged. They're kind of, so, that is, so almost always when you have a lot of negativity, you have lower productivity. And so sometimes uh, aiming at creating um, an environment that would improve the results that a team or a function is trying to achieve uh, will often meet with, uh, you know, very open, open minds on the part of people who who know that this is important to, to really um, address. So I'm hoping some of the techniques will help you, and that you can step up and, and make you know just start the conversation. You don't even have 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 to have the solution. Just hold up a mirror to the culture and see who who else would like to change things. Great. So here's just a comment that came in, Kathy, and we have about eight minutes left, and I know you have more content to present, so I will encourage us toward that. But first, uh, from Janice, we have, um, I don't believe everyone is a disappointed optimist. In today's world culture, I think way too many feel entitled, and if they don't get their way, they won't be positive. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we were having um, a conversation, I, I would ask her, is she talking about the millennials? Who, you know, what, what kind of uh, thread is she, is she feeling? And I do believe that we uh, oftentimes have people in our midst who have that air of entitlement. Um, and that goes back to Carol Dweek's work on a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And a fixed mindset would be an entitled mindset. I'm so talented. I'm so um, smart. I'm so uh, important that I really don't have to put out much effort. And in that situation, many people, the entitled among us, for example, are really suffering. They are suffering from boredom. They're suffering from uh, lack of seeking of rewards and attaching to people. They're real loners. Uh, we, we tend not to want to be around people like that. So I think if we can um, use some of the effort feedback on those folks, you know, it really did make a difference when you showed up on time. The group was able to get started and meet our deadline, that's effort focused. And the impact on me is the way you can help people who feel um, entitled, welcome, welcome them to the human race and to the teams that, that they're on. People do need to understand their impact. 
we have a whole process that we don't have time to go into, but maybe we'll do something, we'll do um, a broadcast later that we call Courageous Conversations. And sometimes you have to let people know uh, what they're doing intentionally or unintentionally that is having a very negative impact. But you always lead with a positive image of the future. And I know you can do better. So I'm going to save that, Becky, for when we have more time. Um, and I would just encourage people not to write others off, that there are ways and, and actually they can be very very motivational. Many people know how important it is to develop other people and uh, if you can use this to short, sharpen your own saw when it comes to developing others, leading others, um, I think you'll find some some new ways to relate to people. And of course you can always bracket them. In other words, you can give up, you can let them be and just move on with the others who are willing to join forces with you. Great. And I think um, I think I actually have a blog about courageous conversations. Um, and so if anybody wants to find that, you just come to my website drkathykramer.com and of course the blogs are right there. There is one about Courageous Conversations. Sounds great. So now we maybe should move on from... We should. Okay, great. And this is one of my favorite, um, favorite examples of leading in a positive way in response to possibilities. And um, Watson, for those of you who, who may not know, is actually a, a computer with artificial um, intelligence and was the winner, as you can see, in um, a Jeopardy game against two of the best Jeopardy players ever, Ken and Brad, and Watson won a million dollars. And the million dollars uh, was actually given to uh, IBM and the inventors of Watson who work at um, IBM and then of course given to charity uh, as a result of Watson's incredible ability. Watson by the way, um, Tom Watson started um, IBM so Watson is named after the founder um, of IBM and I was so honored and thrilled to be able to get an endorsement for the book from a person, David Ferrucci, who is the artificial intelligence scientist at IBM, who is responsible for leading the team that created Watson. And I thought maybe I would read just a little bit about what he said. He said, I stood up to take on the Jeopardy challenge and build Watson when the vast majority of technical leaders at IBM stated it was impossible fantasy and that Ferrucci was a dreamer. So if you're catching on here, if if you're focusing on something that seems impossible, you might be looking in the right direction. He, he, he goes on to say, and when the executives backing the project insisted that Watson had to win to save I, the IBM brand, I look back at what made me successful in the face of such extreme doubt, high stakes, and extraordinary stress. And it's exactly what Kathy Kramer suggests in Lead Positive. He really focused on what he had to work with in terms of his team. He, when he got worried and upset that things were not working on time, were not working well, he focused on his sense of progress. And I think everyone, as I said earlier, needs to be working on a Watson project, working on making something that seems impossible possible. It has to relate to what you're interested in. Watson, by the way, since, since Jeopardy has become an app. There are a series of apps now that are used in the, the medical field. Uh, Watson's artificial um, intelligence is full of databases that have to do with diagnosing and treating different forms of lung cancer. There is a study going on right now, um, a protocol that has nurse practitioners and 
and doctors around the globe asking Watson questions about how the symptoms that they are seeing can be diagnosed and treated. So we have, this is not just a fun and fanciful thing, very much like you, uh, Watson is really dedicated to being able to understand natural language and speech and give people, in this case, the medical case, the protocols that will help heal and cure. So what are you thinking about? What is your moonshot? In the last couple of minutes, I want to teach you a technique that talks about um, what you are going to be able to say in relationship to what you're trying to make happen. And I'm going to use my own example. So um, let's look at the wider the lens, the better the view. So what do you see? How can you create a sense of working on something possible that is important to you? And I will offer you this, this question as a starter. The question is, the starter phrase, I wonder what would happen if. I've been using this now with clients and that really helps break people out of the mold of setting goals that are only incremental. I wonder what would happen if. And my answer is, I wonder what would happen if hundreds of people tuned into this webinar, embraced ABT and practiced the lead positive strategies. I wonder what would happen if. And I actually have this as one of my moonshots, one of my breakthrough um, objectives. And as I do the wondering, I now need to communicate about it. And I just want you to know that there are three elements to high impact communication that highly effective leaders use. And so I'm going to start with substance. This is a good place to start. It's the what, and it's really the IQ of what you have to say. So what I want to accomplish is to grow the community of lead positive leaders so that they can start the ripple effect of leading positive and spreading asset-based thinking. Sizzle, how am I going to do that? I'm going to reach out just like I am today um, in social media, reach out through the book, reach out through live experiences and help people become fluent and and uh, educated, even certified in being able to use the methods that we're talking about today. And the final issue, soul, why this is so important to me, and you always want to put yourself in the picture when you're speaking about your moonshot. Um, I just know that we can go farther faster, that we can achieve remarkable results that are moonshot results if we use the asset-based thinking approach. And I'm not sure, Becky, but I think that might be, we might, might be up against our time. Am I right? We are. Can you show us the final slide with the contact information of how uh, people oh, can sure. find out more about you? There you go. Final slide. Okay, perfect. So Lead Positive is available for sale on Amazon and other online retailers. You can connect with Kathy at her website, drkathykramer.com on Facebook and on Twitter, and we're so thrilled that you all chose to spend an hour with us this afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'll be in touch with follow-up via email, and uh, let's all uh, think about how we can implement these wonderful ideas in our life and work today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Becky.